Good morning. I'm Bill Boulay. I have the honor and privilege of moderating the uh, CISCOM and agency head panel. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, group of uh, individuals here uh, who are going to uh, talk to us today. Uh, we're gonna, the format will be uh, short presentations by each member on the panel, uh, followed by uh, questions and answers from the floor. I have no prepared questions. I'm going to try to go ahead and I will direct uh, uh, questions to the members as necessary. Let me introduce the members of the panel. From the Naval Sea Systems Command, Mr. DeLine, Bill DeLine, He's a member of the Senior Executive Service since, 19, since 2007. He's currently the Executive Director of the Naval Sea Systems Command. He's a senior civilian re official responsible for leading and directing the business operations of NAVC. His duties also include development and execution of long-term strategy. Prior to this, from 2007 until 2012, Mr. DeLine served as the Executive Director for the Program Executive Office for Aircraft Carriers, PEO Carriers. Next to him is Rear Admiral Bruce Baffer, U.S. Coast Guard, and we're pleased to have him here. He currently serves as the U.S. Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Engineering and Logistics and Chief Engineer. In this role, he's responsible for all naval, aeronautical, civil, and industrial engineering and logistics for the service. He previously served as the Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Acquisition and Chief Acquisition Officer. He has served in a variety of engineering and acquisition and operational tours, including engineering officer of Cutter Theus, ex executive officer of Coast Guard Cutter Jarvis, and commanding officer of Theus and Chase. Admiral Bafford graduated from the Coast Guard Academy in 84. He holds a Master of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Illinois, Master's of Business Administration from the University of Massachusetts at Boston, Master of Sciences degrees in Management of Technology from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a Master of Strategic Studies degree from, from the Marine Corps War College. I am definitely the dumbest person on this panel. Um, <laughs> next to him is Major General Ole Knudsen, United States Army. He's the Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Agency. And he was formerly the, formerly the Program Executive for Programs and Integration at MDA. He previously served as the Army's PEO for Missiles and Space. Previous to this, he served as the Director Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology Operations Forward in Iraq. And then as the Deputy Director for Security Assistant Office Afghanistan within the NATO Training Mission Afghanistan. He also serves as the Army's PEO in, in the Army's PO ammunition as the PM for Combat Ammunition Systems. He's a 1982 graduate of West Point, and he earned his master's degree from Monterey, so he has some familiarity with us. Finally, not finally by any means, um, Vice Admiral Terry Benedict is the director of the Navy Strategic Systems Programs. His present uh, flag assignment as program executive officer, previously he was a, his flag assignment was as program executive officer for integrated warfare systems, uh, office of the, of the assistant secretary of the Navy, R RDA. He, is, he has had nine previous billets within SSP in numerous technical branches, including a field tour at the Missile Manufacturing Facility as the Deputy Director, Technical Director. Admiral Benedict also has three tours of Naval Systems, Sea Systems Command, uh, two as, as a systems engineer and as the military executive assistant to the commander. Gentlemen, um, your floor, starting with Mr. DeLine. All right, Bill, thank you very much. So uh, I, I guess I have the honor of uh, following Mr. Stackley here, uh, almost everything he talked about there was in the NAVC portfolio. I'm back there taking notes like crazy. Uh, I wish I knew that much about my own programs. He's got an incredible memory. Uh, so I think one, the, the major theme that we're gonna talk about here is really about technology and technological advancements and the, and the opportunities and, and challenges that that, that brings us. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, very prominent in in the NAVC domain. I, I mean, we're uh, uh, you know we're on a we're on a steep part of the curve here on, on sev in several different domains. I'm going to talk about a couple of them. Um, the the first one is about uh, power energy storage and uh, 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 high power systems and how we integrate that into our platforms. All right, I, I think there is going to be a panel on this later. So the the more 
deep discussion uh, will be later today. But, uh, you know, th this is right here in front of us. I mean, we're, I, I would characterize this as we're, we're slightly behind in where we need to be on being able to handle high power energy uh, within our platforms. I mean, DDG 1000 is certainly here on top of us. We're getting ready to deliver the Ford class uh, later this year, uh, or the Ford, uh, the lead ship of the class. And, uh, and then we have uh, several uh, high energy weapon systems, directed energy weapons just over, over the horizon, right? Uh, that's coming our way, lasers, railgun, and, and those type of things. Uh, we, we cannot afford, so I think there's a, a couple of dilemmas here, challenges and opportunities. Opportunities are, boy, those things present some kind of tremendous war fighting capability. There's no question about that. But the challenge is, is you know, how do you make sure that you smartly integrate that into these platforms from a, from a power generation, from a switching capability, power conditioning, and uh, overall control of that power in the platform? The one thing we cannot afford to do is have each system that, that, uh, that, that needs that high power energy to be bringing their own uh, uh, set of systems and set of equipment uh, that, that performs those functions that I just described. Uh, otherwise, we, that, that will just be unaffordable, okay, because each one of those systems will be paying for all that part, all those parts. And then just from a basic naval architectural standpoint, uh, we will not have enough room, space, and weight capacity in our platforms to, to have all that re resonant. So I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, we're focused on. We've come up with a roadmap uh, that takes a look at where we're heading on, uh, on, the, on power energy storage and how we're going to link up with industry on where they're heading, because that's a very important part of that equation. Uh, you can find that uh, roadmap. It's on our website. We've developed this. It's, a, it's, a, it's there for public release. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good read uh, to go in there and, and understand what the basic components of this are and to get a, get a pretty basic idea of where we think we're heading here on, uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, the other one I want to mention uh, just briefly, uh, Mr. Stackley talked about cyber. Oh, boy, man. I, okay, so... You know, I, I look at that, we have this tremendous mountain to climb in cyber. And I, if I had to grade us where we're at, we might have lifted our foot up off the basin and placed it on the base of mountain uh, is about how far we've come. Uh, we, we have uh, a tremendous challenge in front of us uh, uh, to be able to get to where we need to be on, on cybersecurity. Uh, we're, uh, we're attacking this on several fronts. Uh, one is, is an education. We have to educate our workforce on how, how to be more cyber savvy. I mean, a lot of us, I uh, grew up, and I went to school in the 80s. I was typing in punched cards and feeding it into a mainframe reader and, and compiling my print and going down to the printout room to get the program. Okay, that's, uh, I, I feel really ill-prepared, and I see it in the eyes of a lot of my leadership team of being ill prepared to be able to deal with this, uh, the, the cybersecurity thing. Uh, so training, uh, that's, we've, we've got to get everybody's level of knowledge up considerably to be able to deal with this. And that applies to everybody. Uh, Mr. Stackley, I think said that this is, uh, everybody's all in on this one. Uh, the other one is just uh, making sure that we understand our configurations that are out there today I mean, we've got an, of course we're working on the roadmap, of course we're working on the future architectures of our boundary defense capabilities and how we're going to design cyber in uh, to the systems as they move forward. And we're working with SPA, we're very closely developing standards uh, and, and our own engineering group at NAFC is working on the specifications for machinery control. We have 275 platforms out there right now that have a certain configuration of interconnectivity and a certain set of vulnerabilities uh, in them. And we have to know much more about that configuration and how all those things are interconnected to be able to make sure that we can service the fleet uh, uh, going forward. Uh, we're we're uh, working on a, uh, establishing a cyber security incident response center at the, at the Naval Sea Systems Command headquarters. Uh, we're going to stand it up there. It'll probably end up in the future out somewhere in the field, uh, but uh, where the, where the in-service engineering agents are. But uh, we really need to feel like we've got to get 
leadership attention on this. We have to understand what our, uh, what our configurations are and, and, and we have to be able to understand how we're going to uh, minimize those vulnerabilities uh, with the systems that we have today. And then un understanding that configuration and understanding how all that works will really help inform us as we develop our, our, our the steps in our architects. Because there's no big bang here to get to a full-blown cyber secure, cyber hardened battle group. Okay, that's going to be a, a, a evolutionary process. Uh, it, there's a lot of a lot of sensitivities on the on the what it's going to cost to do that. And to be quite honest, uh, you know, we have to figure out how to leverage the resources that are going into all those programs uh, that perform all those functions today. That's our only hope of being able to, to afford uh, where we're heading on this. We cannot create this cybersecurity thing on the side of all the programs that, uh, that exist today. So, uh, and then I'll, I'll just end with, uh, the, I think the, the other thing that, that keeps me up at night that's a foundation for all these things is just making sure that we can uh, attract, develop, and retain the skilled workforce which, which does all this work. Systems are so much more complicated today. It, 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 you know, no one person really understands how a lot of this works and how it's all interconnected. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a real challenge. And uh, we're, we're putting energy into that uh, to make sure we have that workforce for the future. So with that, I pass it on. Okay, I am going to use some slides here. Not that because I want you to PowerPoint you guys to death, but they're going to be pictures. And I know how this works. Either I put a picture up there of a nice icebreaker that you can look at, or you get to see my face 20 foot across on that screen, which is very disconcerting sitting <laughs> up here. So I'm going to show you some pictures while I talk. There we go. All right. First, thanks for having the Coast Guard here. We certainly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, uh, we've got a lot of involvement in the shipbuilding industry right now. As most of you know, we're recapitalizing our, our surface fleet. Uh, right now with our national security cutters, we're in the last third of that program. They're replacing our 378s, our high endurance cutters. Our fast response cutters, which is our patrol boats, we're in the middle third of that program, which is replacing our 110 foot patrol boats. And our OPC, where we've completed our contract designs and we're in source selection now to down select to a single builder who's going to be building 25 ships to replace our 210 and our 270 foot cutters. So our recap program is going very well. Uh, next on the horizon is heavy icebreakers. You heard the, um, the secretary mention it. Uh, it is a national imperative. The president announced just this last August uh, up in Alaska that we will be building heavy icebreakers for the Coast Guard, and he used an S when he said icebreakers, uh, so we were very pleased to hear that. Uh, he also supported it in his uh, FY17 budget, so it's a real program. It's going forward, and uh, we're looking forward to getting it going. Uh, but like any program, before you get started, you've got to know where you've been. So I want to just take a moment and run everybody through where we've been in the technology of ice breaking. Because everybody thinks, oh, an icebreaker is just a big, heavy ship, right? They're very complicated. These are really, this, this is, the, this is the, uh, the space shuttle of the naval engineering community, the naval architecture community. I just want to run you through it so everybody can appreciate where we are and where we're going. Uh, I love this picture. This is uh, from 29 December 1965. That was the Burton Island, the Atka, and the Glacier pushing an iceberg out of the way down in McMurdo Sound. And remember how much of the iceberg you don't see. That's horsepower. Okay, so we're just going to start at the beginning. This is the, uh, the bear, probably one of the uh, most famous Coast Guard cutters. Uh, it was barketing rigged. It was a sealer for 10 years before the uh, Navy bought it. Actually, the Navy bought it in uh, 1884 for the uh, Greeley rescue mission. Uh, it was a reinforced hull. It's a light ice whaler. It had a compound expansion steam engine, 101 horsepower. Uh, obviously, it had the sails as well. Um, in 1885, then it was transferred to the Revenue Cutter Service, which was the precursor to the Coast Guard. And in uh, 1897, it did the famous rescue where they drove uh, um, reindeer 1,600 miles across the tundra. Uh, folks named uh, Bertoff and, and uh, Jarvis were two of the lieutenants in that, uh, in that uh, expedition that, uh, to save some whalers. Uh, it went back to the Navy in 1917 for World War I. And uh, then after the war, it was bought by uh, Admiral Byrd uh, to do Antarctic expeditions. Uh, went down to Antarctica twice with him. 
1941, it went back to the Navy for World War II, doing the Greenland Patrol. And then in uh, 19 March 1963, it was unceremoniously sunk while under tow, 260 nautical miles east of Boston on its way to become a restaurant. Uh, we're still looking for it. We haven't found it, but it, uh, we've had many other cutters named Bear ever since. But that's really got us into the uh, ice-breaking business. Okay, here's the Northland. This was built in 1926. This is really the start of ice-breaking technology. It was purpose designed to operate in Alaska to replace Bear. It had a six down horsepower, diesel electric, single screw. Um, had the bow rake you see down there at the bottom to ride up on the ice. Uh, but you also see the sails. Uh, like any new technology, we couldn't completely embrace the engine. We had to have the old technology as well. So originally it was fitted with sails just in case that single screw didn't work. And, uh, but they were removed in 1936. Uh, you see the picture there, that it's, that's in its wartime configuration. Those are uh, actually depth charge racks on the side there uh, that they were using. One thing that was interesting about this, it was welded hull. It wasn't riveted. They welded the hull back in 1926 uh, for, the, for the ice service. Uh, that was really uh, cutting edge at that point. And uh, they lined the hull with cork for insulation. Apparently insulating a ship for warmth was a new idea as well. Uh, but uh, we've come a long way since then. Okay, this was the first of our heavy icebreakers. This is the uh, wing class, built in 1942. There are eight of them built uh, for World War II. Four went to Russia under the uh, Lend-Lease program, and four stayed in the, in the U.S. Um, they had uh, 6,500 tons, 12,000 horsepower, diesel electric. They had a healing system. That was new there, where they could heal the ship back and forth to uh, break themselves out. They also had a bow prop. Uh, it's not shown there because it was later removed. And I'm going to talk about bow props in a, in a minute here. But uh, that was a new idea in ice breaking technology, too, to put a uh, bow prop on there. And it was aviation capable. And this is a Burton Island right there. They're using, actually using a, uh, dynamite to help get into McMurdo. Uh, that was the technology at the time, which we don't use anymore. Okay, these are the first real light icebreakers, the Storrs, Bramble, and Spar. Uh, they were originally lighthouse tenders. Uh, they served, uh, actually Storrs served with the Coast Guard for 64 years. We just uh, served into this century. Uh, so they were very capable ships. Uh, their technology really was, you see that boom, they would swing anchor buoys from port to starboard to rock the ship to break themselves out. Uh, so it was kind of low tech, but uh, it worked. Uh, the other thing in the hull, you see that ice knife down there on the bow. That was kind of a new idea, too, at that point, to uh, put an ice knife down on the bow. So this is where freshwater gets involved. This is uh, Mackinac. Uh, Mackinac was built in 1943 for the uh, World War II uh, to bring, uh, be able to uh, ship freight across the Great Lakes year-round uh, for the steel mills, uh, for the uh, war efforts. Fresh water is different than salt water. Ice is a building material, is a very complex uh, material. It bends differently, has different strengths, some is brittle, the fracture mechanics are different. All that has to be taken into account when you build an icebreaker, whether you're doing fresh water, salt water, whether it's single year ice, whether it's multi year ice. It's, it's, not a, it's not a homogeneous material by any means. Um, obviously, in the Great Lakes, you have single year ice, uh, it melts every summer. Um, this ship served for over 60 years. Uh, it was based on the wind class, except for they couldn't have the uh, draft that the wind class had, so they made it wider and deeper to reduce the draft. Had 12,000 horsepower diesel electrics, had a healing system. They could uh, move 160 tons, could be transferred in 90 seconds, and uh, uh, the Coast Guard, well, one, it never left the lakes. Uh, it actually could fit. The lore was it couldn't fit, but it actually could. But uh, it never did leave the f fresh water of the lakes. But uh, the other thing is it never got stuck. It never found ice it couldn't get through. Uh, they would go through a whole ice season with one main diesel engine on, down for an overhaul or what have you, and nobody would notice. It, was, it definitely was a, uh, uh, a, a mean machine or a large piece of, piece of steel that could break, break anything. Now, you see that bow prop on there. That's what was new on, on Mackinac. It wasn't a new idea, but it worked very well in fresh water. Uh, and it wasn't to pull the ship through the water. It was actually to pull the water out from under the ice in front of the ship. You pull the water out from under the ice, the ice cracks under its own weight and gives you a nice seam to drive up. And that, that works very well in fresh water. Didn't work so well in salt water just because of the way the ice breaks, but uh, Mackinac used it and uh, used it to great effect. Here's our polar class icebreakers. Uh, the Secretary 
mentioned it, uh, we've got one heavy uh, polar class icebreaker, the Polar Star. Uh, it just finished deep freeze this summer down in McMurdo, breaking uh, McMurdo out and resupplying the station down there. It's on its way back right now. Uh, they're 40 years old, and uh, they're 75,000 ho 75, horsepower. They break six feet of ice at three knots, 21 feet of ice with backing or ramming. So thinking about that, you got a two-story building that's in your way. You hit it, it stops. You back up further and hit it harder, and you keep doing that until you get through. That's what naval engineering is all about. That, <laughs> if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what does. These are the most powerful non-nuclear uh, icebreakers in the world. Uh, they're diesel electric, they got three shafts, one rudder, CPP props. That's been a, a maintenance challenge for us uh, fr from the start with these ships. Uh, at one time they had a healing system, but uh, we don't use them anymore. Our bay class icebreaking tugs, uh, we still operate these in the Great Lakes and uh, up, the, uh, up the rivers to deliver home heating fuel. They're 2,500 horsepower, diesel electric, they have fix, fixed pitch props. Uh, what's unique about these, you see that, uh, see the bubbles coming up on the hull. On the fan tail there, you see that van, it's a bubbler van. There's a uh, diesel power compressor that blows uh, uh, low pressure air out the hull to lubricate the hull along the ice. Um, it speeds up in, in 16 inch of plate ice. They can make four knots. When they turn the bubbler system on, speed goes up to six knots. So you get a 50% increase just with the air blowing out the hull. So that was the technology that they applied here. Uh, th these are very competent, cost-effective uh, icebreakers. Uh, and we're uh, slapping them now to get another 15 years of service life out of them. Okay, this is Healy. It's, uh, I I'd say this brought us into the modern icebreaker age. Uh, modern icebreaking era. It's a medium capacity research platform. It's at 420 feet and uh, 16,000 tons. It's, it's the Coast Guard's largest ship. It uh, uses uh, AC synchronous drive motors. It has an integrated AC plant. Uh, it does four and a half feet of ice at three knots and uh, it's coming up for its midlife pretty soon. The, uh, you might remember seeing on the news in 2012, it, it, it escorted that tanker into Nome to deliver fuel up in Nome where Nome was going to run out of fuel that year. The, they didn't get their delivery in in time and uh, it, it resupplied them. And on the 5th of September, just this last year, it reached the North Pole. It was the first U.S. surface vessel to reach the uh, North Pole unescorted. Okay, back to fresh water, here's a new Mackinac. This is a, uh, a buoy tenor icebreaker. And the, uh, it breaks uh, 32 inches in ice, ice at three knots or 10 knots at 14 inches. The new technology on this was those azipods you see there. Uh, and the ability to direct your thrust is just huge. That's a game changer with this, uh, with this uh, hull. It was interesting that the Great Lakes carriers wanted an icebreaker to replace Mackinac. The Coast Guard needed a buoy tender. And if you think about what makes for a good buoy tender, shallow draft, nimble, um, uh, maneuverable and what makes a good icebreaker large large beam heavy you know they're, they're diametrically opposed requirements well those azipods really made it possible to combine both requirements and we've got a very competent buoy tender and a very competent icebreaker in the same platform so this this really was a, a new technology for us that was a game changer especially since what this ship does is it has to break those thousand foot Great Lakes carriers out they, they go in and they get stuck so you have to break them out the old Mackinac the problem is you, you back down and then you hit the gas to blow the, blow the um, ice out of the way. Well, the ship takes off. Then you get to back down again, do it again. These are large ships operating at full throttle at very close maneuvering situations. This is really hard for a ship handler. What this ship does is it, it can go in there and you can oppose your, your, your thrust so your ship doesn't move, but you've got full power going out both sides to blow the ice out. So what it can do is it can circumnavigate a beset 1,000-foot uh, laker in 12 minutes and 32 inches of solid level ice. So instead of taking hours to break somebody out, they just go in there and take 15 minutes to do a, do a circle around them, and away they go. But uh, that was a huge, uh, huge technology change for us. You also see the ice breaking stern on there. They turn the azipods around a stern, and you've got front wheel drive. They actually can mill into the ice. That's you know, that, for naval engineer, that gets me excited as well. You know, the idea of corkscrewing into the ice to pull the ship through, that's, uh, that's a new, new thing. All right, so here, here's looking forward. Here's our new heavy icebreaker. And, and, you know, this is where you guys come in because you get once in a generation 
the opportunity to design a new heavy icebreaker. You know, to a naval engineering, to a naval engineer, this really is our Apollo moment. The president went out there, he threw down a challenge. He said he accelerated the program. He said, we're doing heavy icebreakers. We need to have year-round access to all corners of the globe. That requires this capability. The nation's going to do it. The nation's calling. We're going to rise to the challenge, and we need you all to do that, because this is going to be a huge design effort. Uh, and like I showed, all those different technologies, some are going to apply, some aren't going to apply, but uh, we're, we're moving the program ahead at best speed. The requirements document is done. The requirements are going to be very similar to the Polar Class. The Polar Class has been very successful doing a heavy icebreaker mission. They just need to be replaced, and we need to do it with new technology that's supportable. And you've got to do it in a ship that's got to transit the most open, hottest, uh, warmest seas in the world to get to the most inhospitable, co coldest, unsupported areas in the world. It has to be self-supporting, it has to be dependable, it has to be reliable, and it has to get it done without contractors waiting for you because they just, you can't call up uh, Granger down there in the Antarctica and get those parts delivered. So it's, uh, this really is where the rubber meets the road or where the ice meets the hull. And uh, uh, we're really looking forward to you all helping us get there. And so I look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, well, good morning and, and thanks for having me. Admiral Searing, I know, was on the agenda and many of you were hoping to see him, so I'm the substitute this morning. He had something that came up. Um, as I said earlier, I did get to spend a couple of years with a bunch of naval engineers before, a long time ago at uh, the Naval Postgraduate School and getting a mechanical engineering degree, so I've spent a little bit of time with an audience like this before. Um, I don't have the degree of history to talk about in missile defense that we just heard from about icebreakers. I'm, but I, I, we're about 100 years less than that. I would tell one quick anecdote. Um, uh, last year, I got to spend a, uh, a little bit of time with Secretary of State Schultz. And he told a story about what happened in the mid 80s with the Strategic Defense Initiative and the negotiations with the Soviets and Gorbachev and President Reagan. And he said, essentially, um, President Reagan was able to sell them the sleeves off a vest on, on where we were then, and that's kind of stuck with me. That's not where we are now on missile defense. Uh, we've come a long ways, and so the, the components obviously are, are sensors, the ability to uh, track, acquire, and discriminate um, the shooters that go along with that, and then the um, C2 and battle management systems that hook it all together, and we've made you know, a significant amount of progress over the last several years and all of those things. And the, the really the fundamental um, technology that, that has caused us to be able to advance it, certainly in, in every other place too, is the advancement in computing power and in small sizes that we can pack into missiles and we can deploy into smaller spaces for the ground components and, and really the, the massive amount of gain that is there in, in computing power. and so. And, and that has enabled us to do this thing that we call hit to kill. And if you went back 20 years ago, we weren't doing any of that. And you know, hit to kill is, is essentially equated to hitting a bullet with a bullet. Um, it's still somewhat baffling how the, the speeds are because it's many miles a second that these two objects are closing in on each other. And we're able to do it in, I'll call it a very accurate, I won't get into the numbers on hitting big objects with other big objects very accurately, and we've done it many times now. It hasn't all been perfect. We've learned over the last 15 years, but over 15 years of doing this, um, we're at about an 80% success rate in every test that we've done. And, and the earlier test obviously had less successes, and we've learned from that, and we've uh, taken engineering lessons from that and built them back into future designs. And, and where we are is that we have a capability to hit the kill. There's no doubt about it. It's just p plain physics and engineering. Um, we, we do have the challenge of cost of it, um, and, and that's what, what I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but on the other aspects of it, the sensors, we have a great ability to do sensing and discrimination uh, that we've gained over the last several years. It's in um, the Aegis BMD ships as it was talked about by uh, Mr. Stackley, it's in a uh, ground system that the Army has, it's in our homeland defense systems that we have sensors essentially spread out around the world um, and in space that we were able to 
and then take that sensing and hook it together with what we call our C2 BMC, our battle management system that we have for the missile defense. And we also have supported the Army's upgrade to theirs and the Navy's upgrade to theirs and the Air Force upgrade to their systems to tie it all together. So, so we've made great strides, but we have many challenges um, because the biggest challenge we have is that in the area of missile defense, the threat has grown in both, I'll call it capability and capacity significantly over the last, uh, call it 10 to 15 years as we've been growing capability, whether they've been watching what we've doing and reacting and trying to get ahead of us, but they're there. And there's, so it's a, both a quantity where they have large quantities and, and to some degree now, or a large degree now, it's also um, their capability of doing more sophisticated things with countermeasures and with maneuvering warheads. Um, and so all of those things are what we're working to come up with ways to counter. And our biggest thing that we need is um, better discrimination because we have to make every shot count. And if there's a lot of countermeasures or other objects up there, we don't want to shoot one of our hit the kill missiles at something that isn't the, the actual object that we're trying to defeat. And so that's quite a challenge as, um, as they become more sophisticated in their countermeasures. But we've already demonstrated that we can defeat a lot of countermeasures. Uh, we recently did a, a test on our homeland defense where we put up a pretty sophisticated countermeasure scene and, and we uh, had a number of sensors and gained a lot of data out of that that we're gonna be able to ripple into our improvements in the system. And then the other aspects of the of the challenges really are the cost. And so sometimes it's talked about cost per kill that we, they have relatively cheap ballistic missiles, but as they become maneuvering and all kinds of things like that, they, they become actually more expensive on their end too. And that's what's happening, but, but they are relatively cheaper than what the interceptors have been to uh, counter them. And so that's a, that's a challenge from just the, being able to buy enough quantity um, to counter the, the volumes that are out there. And so we're working on another, a number of things, and I'll talk about those in a minute, uh, on how we can drive down the cost per kill. And then the other challenge we have is integration with our, call it coalition and partners. So we, when we're encouraging them to get as much capability as they, as they can, that's actually part of our strategy for regional defense is that we can't buy enough missiles and enough systems and deploy enough to d defend everywhere in uh, UCOM, CENTCOM, and PACOM. And so we're working with our, our allies and partners there for them to get their own capacity. But then we have to be able to integrate it together effectively because if we're there and they're there and we're all shooting at the same thing because we don't have an integrated, coordinated system of how we're doing engagements, all right, we gain some by having them having capacity, but we can gain a lot more if we uh, really get it integrated. And there's a number of challenges with that um, a lot of them have to do actually with policy and who we can share information with. And so those things are being worked. Um, and many of you that have been involved in this, I'm sure some of you have, know that that seems to be from an engineering point of view, an easy thing to solve. But from a policy point of view, it's not an easy thing to solve, but what data we share with who. Um, and so I, we, we continue to make progress on that, and because it's not an engineering problem, I think we will actually get to the point where we have that pretty well worked out and we're, we're working on that. And then I'd say the fourth challenge, and I'll be the third guy this morning to talk about it, is really our cybersecurity, okay? And, and so we've um, really done some in-depth look at that over the last several months within MDA, and we've kind of broken it down into two categories. We'll call it our mission systems, which are the deployed systems that are out there, the Aegis BMD um, ships, the THAAD systems, the, the ground-based mid-course defense, and all of our sensors. And then we've taken a look at our enterprise system is what we're calling it, which is a different look at it, but they're both um, significant problems and challenges that we have because we really didn't design the systems to have it in. Um, that's what's been talked about earlier. We haven't figured out what I'll call are the tactics, techniques, and procedures, CONOPS, or SOPs of how to um, really guard against what's going on well enough. We've got some of those in place, but not, not enough. And as was talked about earlier, we don't have enough education and training that's gone on. That's our assessment of it, and we're working on all of those. 
And the fundamental thing is probably even more of a cultural thing for all of our engineers that are involved and everyone else, because everyone tends to think, all right, some IT guy's going to take care of that problem for me, and I don't have to worry about it. And quite frankly, I'm guilty of that too. Um, and so we all got to change, because the way I've kind of been able to look at it in my own mind is to say, particularly on the enterprise, and I'll say on the enterprise side of it, that's really where all our data is stored. And it's now called controlled defense information. It used to be all unclassified technical information. We changed the term. But there's a whole lot of data out there. And if we equate data that all our engineers, whether it's in the government or our contractors that we paid for, if we equate that data to money and we say, where is our money and how is it being protected, we maybe would think about it differently. Because we wouldn't take $100 million and put it in a bird cage and chain it down to a park bench in Central Park, New York, and say, well, OK, I got it locked up. I hope nobody comes and takes it. But we sort of have done that to a large degree with our data. Um, it's not well protected. And, and, and so what we're working with our, all of our partners in industry and our labs is to say, OK, tell us what data is where at every level in the supply chain, and how is it being protected? All right, so that we can get after the risk assessments. And that would seem to be an easy question to answer. It's not, OK? And, and then, you know, then we got to get after really doing it. Because in some ways, this data has really been showing up in other places. And we can say, well, OK, I'm not sure that's happening. But we can go look at systems that are coming out and say they look almost exactly like our systems. And we got to stop kidding ourselves about this. And even though it's the unclassified data, when they're, you got trained engineers and physicists on the other side and everybody that here, there's all the stories that we can reverse engineer it. Well, they can reverse engineer it and put the critical parameters are that we kept on the secret side in and, and come out with a system for a lot less cost than what we put in. So it's almost like we're putting in dollars and feeding several other, I'll call it potential adversaries systems. And, and so we really got to get after the cyber thing. Um, the opportunities that we see to uh, make some significant gains are, are really in space where we can get persistent surveillance. Um, there's certainly ways to do that. There's challenges with cost of being able to do that. And quite frankly, we're looking to partner with other organizations to share the cost in a, in a dual or mission mode. And then the other aspects are really in directed energy. We, we're doing a, a bunch of work on directed energy, both to uh, improve our ability to do um, track and discriminate and to be able to um, do what we call boost phase kill. Um, it's a derivative of what we did earlier, some efforts that were done to, you know, laser a target in, in its early stages before it can deploy countermeasures. There's a lot of work left to be done on it, but it still does look like a promising technology to drive down the cost per kill. And then we're looking at things that we call the multi-object kill vehicle, which is really putting several kill vehicles on the top of a booster so that what you have in the hole in the infrastructure, you get the potential to have many kill vehicles to handle more complex scenes. Um, and then on the coalition partner side, we are looking at cross-domain solutions. And there's some RFIs we've recently put out and got great responses back. So we haven't implemented those yet. but. Um, and that, that, that not only handles, uh, I'll call it the techno exchange of data with coalition partners, but it also has to handle the cyber aspects of that. And that makes the cyber aspects of transferring the data with coalition partners makes the problem uh, a, a degree more difficult. Um, and, and so we're looking for solutions to do all those things. And with that, I'll say just thanks for having me here. Thanks. Okay, well, good morning. Um, I'm going to start with going back to a comment Mr. Stackley made, which is the Navy's number one shipbuilding program today, um, by both his statements and the CNOs, is the Ohio Replacement Program. And so, as we are involved at SSP with that program, uh, as we went through the initial requirements setting for that program, uh, we settled on 12 boats with 16 tubes. And one of the primary decision points that got us to that 
that, those two numbers was the demonstrated performance of the Triton II D5 weapon system. Today, after 159 flights over the last 26 years, in unclassified terms, we're at about 115% of our reliability specifications, and we're at about 240% of our original accuracy specifications. So we're doing pretty well after 26 years. But as we looked at the system, we recognized that we were going to have to life extend it. So we'd set the numbers in terms of the number of submarines and the number of tubes on those submarines. So when we set the life extension parameters, we couldn't go back to the original design requirements for reliability and accuracy. We had to insist that we maintained demonstrated performance. So what I'd like to do today is just walk you through three unique uh, implementations of what I think are common good engineering practice, but how we use those in order to ensure that through our life extension program, which we're in the middle, actually we're at the very end of it, and we'll IOC the D5 life efforts next year in fiscal year 17, how we were able to maintain our demonstrated reliability and accuracy in the design parameters. So the original Triton II D5 design was done essentially in the late 70s, early 80s. So as everyone in this room is well aware, industries changed radically uh, in the state of the art from that time frame. And while that's good in some instances for us, it's, it's diametrically opposed to those things that as director SSP I have to worry about. Specifically, electri uh, electrical components, they've gotten very much smaller power much less, density much greater. And so while those are all great in terms of an industry moving forward, for someone like SSP who has to think about radiation hardened environments, and I'm not talking solar radiation requirements, I'm talking nuclear event radiation hardened environments, those, those actual parameters cause us great concerns and actually great issues as we try and incorporate the latest technology into where we were going with the life extension programs. So I'd like to talk this morning about three very common processes, but the way that we implemented those in order to achieve our success that we have today. First one being model-based engineering. Model-based engineering, there's nothing great or, or cutting edge about model-based engineering. But I will tell you that model-based engineering, if implemented in a very, very disciplined process, gets you more than just the output during the design phase. So what we required from the beginning, from day one, was that all system simulations and modeling had to be done in this model-based engineering environment. And if there's one thing that I think SSP or naval reactors brings to any program uh, discussion, it's one of uh, exacting discipline. So what we said to all the vendors who wanted to participate with us uh, in this life extension effort was that all, all, underline all, component vendors had to provide models for, their, for consideration, and not just up front as we thought about the system, but it was a contractual requirement and one that we, we enforced without any uh, variation is that throughout the entire life cycle, as we went from simulations to breadboards to prototypes to actual hardware, all the models had to be updated continuously to represent the actual hardware that we were then dealing with. So out of that, and over time, the higher levels of details that we actually incorporated through the breadboards, through the prototypes, and into the actual final development hardware, all of that was captured in our model. We started the process in this model-based engineering, we went from, from the component vendors. And so as we start, we were able to do the cost versus performance trades, which allowed us eventually to down select to the accelerometers and gyros that we, uh, that we eventually captured. But you know, model-based engineering brings much more. It captures the design knowledge. 
Uh, and that, I think that's critical as we work in industrial entities that are at what I call very sort of six sigma of the, of the industry parameters. We're not a tactical system, we're a strategic system. We work in some environments that if we're not working in them, nobody else is working in them. And so we're able to develop that knowledge and that critical skill that we'll use throughout the rest of the program. The second thing I'd like to talk to is mod modular architecture. Again, this is not rocket science, right? But I'm gonna define modular architecture as the capability to replace a specific instantiation of a critical technology and or a specific system function with acceptable impact. You know, we've been a program this last fall, we celebrated our 60th anniversary as a program. And we're now in our sixth generation of strategic nuclear deterrence. And what's really interesting is while 60 years is something most programs don't get to go to or, or ever celebrate, we're not halfway done. If you heard Mr. Stackley, the Ohio replacement program will be in the water through 2080, so do the math. We have 64 more years to go. So when we think of systems, we think of that very long timeline that most programs don't even contemplate. So modular architecture for us, as we think about the guidance system and we think about where instruments and sensors are moving in the future, is absolutely critical from a cost standpoint, from a risk standpoint, to be able to, at some point in the future, upgrade the system without starting from scratch and redesigning the entire system. So it starts with a smart partitioning of functions. And the way that we partitioned the functions was based on the critical technologies that are inherent within a strategic inertial guidance system. The sensors, the gyros, the accelerometers, the stellar detectors, and I think everyone here has some appreciation that as we're flying a Trident missile, we actually rotate the missile, open the window, and physically shoot the position of a star. And with that star sighting, as we're actually flying, we then calculate the error from the intended trajectory to the known position. We remove that error before we start actually releasing the weapons. All of this has to be done, again, in a radiation-hardened environment that is a nuclear invent environment. So in addition to the sensors, rad-hard memory and rad-hard processors are all part of how we chose to to partition the, the architecture. We then down-selected those components that, and I'm sorry, the, the down-selection of those components could then be delayed beyond the system PDR. And that goes back to the model-based engineering. Because we had a good definition and instantiation within the simulations, I can actually delay the down-select of the actual component to allow it to mature. But it also enabled this modular architecture a, to do a hardware in the loop testing. We developed a flat panel display of the guidance system, which we had easy access to all the points. And, the t and coupling that with the, with the model-based engineering, we were able to integrate the hardware with the simulations, with the software, so we could do subsystem verification, we could do uh, virtual integration, and then actually in the end, physical integration on a flat panel display before we packaged into the actual two packages. But I think per perhaps the most important uh, innovation that the that SSP has done in the last 60 years is a program called Enhanced Ground Testing. And let me just take a moment and explain why I think this is something that within the program we're very proud of how we did this. We set a goal for ourselves for the first time in the history of the 60-year program that with this type of a development program, we would not fly off of a land-based pad capability, but we would go and fly the first missile with the new guidance system, with the new missile electronics directly from the submarine. And so you can, inv you can just imagine the amount of quantifiable data necessary to do the safety risk analysis to ensure that that was indeed a correct choice. So we took the flight environments, we mapped those into what we called cells, 
And then we went about a, a very detailed process to figure out how we could replicate those cells and convince ourselves that the addition of all those cells actually represented the actual environment of the missile. So the cells were broken down into thermal and vibration and shock, again, normal, normal environments that we all have to deal with. But then we had to integrate those onto a shaker table and then operate the electronics assembly package as well as the inertial measurement unit package in three environments while we are actually operating the system, acquiring the data, uh, something we've never done before. We developed a, an acceleration profile based on a 32-foot long ex, uh, centrifuge and then created a program that said that would represent the acceleration. But I think the most innovative thing that we did is we worked with the United States Air Force and we actually developed a pod that we certified for flight under the wing of an F-15. And in flying that aircraft, we were able to replicate exactly the acceleration profiles for the first stage, the second stage, and the third stage. So we put the EA and the IMU in this pod with the requisite cooling uh, subsystem. We flew the aircraft, did the exact profile of a Triton II D5 missile. We flipped the aircraft over, shot a star, and came back and landed. Why is that so critical? That's absolutely critical because not only did we have the data that was captured real time in the performance of those two packages, but we actually had the packages. And that's something that when you're dealing with flight hardware, it may seem obvious, but it's the real drawback in dealing with flight hardware. It's sort of like the pharmaceutical company. The only pill or aspirin that you know really met all the requirements is the one you just took and it cured your headache. Of course, it's not available for sale. Same thing with flight hardware. The only missile I know that actually worked and met all the requirements is the one I just flew. Now, of course, I don't have it for deterrence. So in developing this construct where we could test in real environments, actual environments, and have the hardware as well as the data and then match the two together, we were able to create that quantifiable evidence that we could put to the safety folks that said, yes, we can fire this 130,000 pound missile off of a manned submarine for the first time with the high confidence that it would perform its mission. And, and we've been able to do that. But in addition to what I just talked about for model-based engineering or modular architecture or the EGT, what we've really done is set a structure that will support us for the next 64 years. We now have a very quantifiable environment in which we can do surveillance and reliability testing, as well as failure assessment to a level of detail that we've never had in the program before. We can do Assess, we can assess modifications for the future. We can look at new instruments, new sensors, as they, as they are integrated in, and we can actually quantify the delta performance difference between that which we have and that which, which we may consider going to. But I think the greatest attribute that came out of this entire effort for the life extension is a deep level of design knowledge in the next generation of design engineers that we were able to grow at Draper Laboratories and the other major prime contractors as we did this integration effort. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for those great comments. Uh, and now I invite uh, questions from the audience. Thank you, Glenn, for stepping up first. You Go ahead. I've got to break the ice here, <laughs> Admiral Baffin. Um, Admiral Benedict, thank you for mentioning, mentioning modularity. Um, and one of, the f one of the focal points of this year's ASNI is trying to take that kind of thinking and enlarge the base of people within the Navy that are looking at platforms and the Coast Guard looking at platforms in order to think about what we're calling or what has been called the flexible warship. Um, what I was going to do is, is ask Mr. DeLine and Admiral Baffer a question that 
I would, was hoping that you could address so that we could bring it up in this afternoon's Global Shipbuilding Executive Summit. And that is, are there spe specific offices within NAVC and the Coast Guard Engineering where you have, uh, for lack of a better term, futurist looking at requirement sets for the future in order to put the kind of modularity that we've been able to put into missile, missile containers. Started the process in this model-based engineering, we went from to allow future upgrades uh, for, for missions of the future. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks for that question. That, that's a good question, and we have uh, given this a lot of thought, and we have made specific changes at NAVC to get at this. I mean, you can, uh, modularity, I mean, you go at this a couple of different ways. Uh, commonality is also another way that gets you there, and, and you, you talk about the interface as you get to the interface standards uh, to, to be common, and then that makes you more modular. Uh, we have uh, created a new organization in FC, in FC 06. Uh, if you've been around a long time, that was, it, it's not your father's 06 on the combat, you know, the C4I stuff in combat. But uh, this one is focused on uh, trying to work standards and specs and processes and procedures across the five PEOs uh, uh, to get at, uh, you know, commonality. When we have a tremendous amount of variation in the in the fleet and uh I, I we we have the numbers on just how many different variations of motors and actuators and and uh you know all the different hm and e type configurations that are out there and that's killing us from a life cycle cost standpoint right so there's a real affordability strategic imperative here to neck down that variation and uh and i think that that's a win uh, to me it's a win-win because you're not only going to reduce life cycle costs you're going to reduce acquisition costs if you can get down to that family of systems uh that you're going to go at so i co6 uh headed by R Admiral tom kearney uh is, is a great entry point into the naval sea systems command for that and then certainly our engineering directorate uh nav co5 is all over uh, the engineering and technical standards associated with commonality so we're we're all in on, on the uh, you know ad flexibility, adaptability. Uh, in fact, I believe you're going to find that uh, DDG 1000. Take a very close look at DDG 1000 and CVN 78. You're going to find major parts of that ship that was completely uh, uh, designed for complete flexibility and adaptability to reconfigure mission areas without ever doing any hot work. And that, in fact, that was one of the requirements that we came up with on the Ford class for the middle part of the O3 level was we want to be able to reconfigure those mission areas and not touch it with, with a welder or foundation work. And, I, and, and so that's here now, and we, I think that's going to pay off huge uh, for the fleet as we go forward. Yeah, I was kind of glad to hear Vice Admiral Benedict talk about that they've got a 60-year outlook because they're very strategic, and one of the criticism of the Coast Guard is we don't tend to be strategic, but we do have a 60-year outlook because that's how long we keep our ships. Uh, so we're, we're <laughs> fooling ourselves if we don't do that. So uh, I'm glad to know we've got a lot in common. Uh, we do have a system called the Evergreen System when you mention futurists, and they are some future forward-looking folks. Um, they come up with all the ideas. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if we've really been effective in predicting the future far enough out for a shipbuilding program to really be able to accommodate it. Uh, what we do do though is when we're designing our ships and looking at our ships, we realize that our missions change over time. Our current 378s that were designed in the mid 1960s uh, were originally designed for ocean stations. They were designed to sit off of, of, of um, um, New York City and give weather forecasts to to the airport because there was no other way to get the weather forecast coming in offshore. And so they would sit there and rock and roll for three months at a time. Well, those ships now, they chase drugs, they chase semi-submersibles, they chase migrants, they chase everything. The, the mission of those ships has changed so many times over the years that we've had to go in there and, and make changes to the ship in order to keep them relevant and, and effective in the current mission set. So we're, we're kind of fooling ourselves that we think the current mission right now is always going to be the same in the future. Uh, what we don't need to do 
you know, when we talk about flexible ships, the idea of being able to do something without welding, you need to do that if you have to do it in a hurry. You know, the mission packages, the, the drop and load payloads, the, uh, uh, that, are, that are some, a lot of warships are going to, to be able to change the, uh, the weapons package, we've got a little more flexibility there. We just need to be able to go inside the ship and make those changes that are needed sometime within the life of the ship, because we design them for 30 years, but we keep them for 60. So those changes need to be able to be done not necessarily in 72 hours or, or a week or, you know, in a regular midlife. We can plan that once we know what they are. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different when you design a warship, though, the HM&E is just the, the C-frame. It's what's carrying around the weapon system. And it's the weapon system that's always changing. With an icebreaker, the HM&E is the weapon system. That's not going to change. That's what you're using. So you're, you're, the, you're the tip of the spear as a naval architect on an icebreaker weapon system as opposed to being somebody that's supporting another weapon system. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Bill Patterson, uh, General Dynamics. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about IR&D, um, internal research and development. Um, the ind industrial base will spend probably a little over a billion dollars uh, this year and each year on IR&D. And uh, I've talked to many of my uh, colleagues and we have varied um, success in breaking into uh, your organizations in particular, but across the board and, and how do we partner, really partner in how we spend that billion dollars so that you can take some advantage of it. We're going to spend the money, um, and it's going to be spent on what we hope is the right thing for you. But uh, as I've heard several of you say, hope is not a strategy. Um, how, how do we partner with you? How do we really align with you? How do we ensure that we're doing what you need us to do for the next three, five, seven years, which is where IRAD's focused? You want to start? Cause I'll yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I so I got to tell you that that was an area. So when I was in PO Cares, I don't I don't get as much involved in that now as, as I'm the executive director of the command. Uh, but when I was in the PEO, I was always frustrated by the fact that I didn't have as much input in and in voice into the IR and D streams at our industry partners as well. So, uh, boy, it sounds like we're we're frustrated on both ends of this equation here. Uh, we do have some forums, though, in the in the shipbuilding industry that I think would help inform you of where we're going. And the, in the uh, uh, you know, I, I, to me, this all comes down to uh, you know, in the shipbuilding industry, affordability. All right, we we have got to continue to look for ways that that takes less and less labor hours to assemble these ships. All right, that that has gotten uh, that has gone up over time, and. Uh, uh, through our National Shipbuilding Research Project, NSRP, I, I, I think that's a great forum to look into to see all the different areas that we're looking at of where we're interested in going at, uh, you know, how to, how to better assemble things, how, how better welding techniques uh, to drive down those, those labor costs in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in shipbuilding. So that, that would be one area I would take a look at. But I'll tell you, I just there, there's no better way than just you know direct contact. You know what our PEOs are. Our our program structures inside those PEOs are pretty well known. Uh, if you want to see them, go to our small business webpage uh, uh, on the Naval Sea Systems Command website, and you'll see every program, every deputy program manager listed in there. And depending on what platform you want to talk about, you've got the contacts right there, and you can get in there and have have that dialogue. That, that direct dialogue with the uh, with the PEOs on uh, you know what's troubling them and uh, to help better inform your IR and D uh, investments. So I think that's a great one. I think we're we're as equally frustrated on our end. So I I, I would just add um, we're sort of bookends of this problem and and I don't have that problem. You know, I've had uh, the same industry partners on sole source contracts for 60 years. So, uh, <laughs> so I have pretty tight relationships with the industry partners and it is a partnership. And so we're able to have those conversations about how we use government R&D and industry IRAD to create the most robust response for the program over the, over the remaining time of the program. So, um, kind of bookend issues here on short-term contracts, 
competitively won and, and up for competition at some point in the future versus long-term stable sole source contracting that I operate in. Hi. Uh, I have a question right. about the icebreakers. Um, given what they do is in kind of a confined environment and it's fairly slow, has any thought been given to unmanned icebreakers? And if so, if not, what are the challenges that would prevent that from being a reasonable idea? And maybe a semi-submersible instead of a, a surface ship? Well, I mean, right now we do have manned submarines that uh, can handle that. Uh, uh, the, the point is we need to have surface access to the, to the Earth. Um, I suspect the issue would probably be uh, cost or affordability of that requirement to unman the icebreaker. It would kind of be like Google Cars, one step at a time, in that the automation allows for reduced manning levels. Uh, but a lot of times with the automation, you find out that people are cheap compared to the software it requires to replace those people. And so you're doing that cost-benefit trade-off. Uh, there are certainly opportunities to reduce crew but I think probably maybe that's one of those issues for our futurists to start thinking about is uh, uh, at what point do we remove the crew? Uh, and then what are the legal ramifications? Is it still a sovereign vessel of the United States? And what does it do for the, uh, the, you know, the issue of sovereignty and, and uh, presence? Uh, if you've got a piece of steel with no human presence, does that really count as presence? I don't, I don't know. That would be a good, good, good issue for the lawyers to chew on. But uh, uh, I think... Uh, we can probably head that direction, but it's probably not going to be designed into, into these current next generation of icebreakers. Yes, sir. Uh, Joe Lockhart with private industry, but spent a lot of time in NAVC and off NAV. But it's, my question is geared towards NAVC. Uh, everyone has talked about cyber. We don't know anything about it. We don't know how to get there, you know, what to do. And I thought I heard you say that you were going to stand up in office and then eventually pass it out as a field activity. I think that would be the, just the last thing you want to do of losing the visibility at the SISCOM. You may set up separate offices, but the way I heard it, it's like throwing it over the fence. Yeah, no. No, that's, uh, uh, sorry if, I, if it uh, came out that way. Uh, the, the office that we were standing up, and I, I will hesitate to call it an office, uh, we're, uh, we're standing up a, an ability to, re, to do incident response to the fleet. That's, that's what we're standing up. Okay, not an office. Cybersecurity, uh, while, we're, while we're working specs and standards in our technical authority and working that collaboratively with SPA War, that's, that's centralized in NAVC 05. The commander's intent is very clear. And this is uh, you know, everybody's job, okay? Every, every organization in NFC has a responsibility uh, for uh, understanding the configuration of their systems and having the, uh, uh, the understanding of how we're gonna embed cybersecurity in those systems as we go forward, how we're gonna deal with the configurations we had today, and then how we're gonna move towards the architectures that we're defining through these specs and standards. We're not standing up a separate office for for cybersecurity, it's an embedded part of our day jobs across the command. All I was referring to is we, we've got to do a better job at being able to respond to do incident response as these things come up in the fleet. The, the one thing that, that uh, you know, we're worried about, and we've had a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll call them near misses or you know, false alarms maybe where we thought maybe something was going on and then it turned out to be, well, okay, it wasn't. We were very slow to respond. You know, our, our knowledge of our configurations from a cybersecurity standpoint, we learned was not where it needed to be. All right, and so we're working very, you know, we're working very vigorously to try to close that gap and to give ourselves better situational awareness of of the of the of the cyber configuration that are in the fleet today. And so that's the office of that I was talking about. Now that, so we're, we are, we're absolutely working through all of our program offices uh, uh, to make sure that 
that our specs and standards that are coming out for how we want cybersecurity designed into our systems, that that is being uh, put in our, our contracts now, and then those dialogues are being had with, with industry. And that's going to, okay, I know it's never going to move as fast as we'd like it to, uh, but we are moving in that, in that direction. And this is part of that, I think this is part of that dialogue, right? So like I said, we got a big mountain to climb, and <laughs> we're only right at the base of the mountain. So uh, I, I would encourage uh, for forums like this, lots of dialogue on cyber, panels like this that get down to the next level down when, when you start talking about how we're going to architect these systems going forward. Uh, challenge us on what we're doing. Uh, you know, we're, we're actually expecting that input from you. Uh, we're not going to get this right right out of the gate, and it's going to evolve over time. Some We're talking about we don't know but the idea of whether it's going on or someone that kind of is looking at it and telling you rather than you waiting for it to come to you. No, no, we're not we're not waiting. We're definitely not waiting on for it to come to us. Uh, to that end, there is a cyber panel after the break at uh, <laughs> eleven fifteen. Um, and I encourage everyone to uh, who is interested in this in this to uh, to go to the cyber panel. Uh, Amo Rabago. Yep. Ron Rabago, uh, thanks. And I was getting excited in my seat, Bruce, as you were going through the naval engineering aspects of icebreakers. That was pretty good stuff. <laughs> um, my question is, um, and you all talked about it to some degree, which is governance. Clearly, um, the government doing everything or industry doing everything in any endeavor is, is not productive. And, and when I see, um, when I see, when I hear uh, uh, Secretary Stackley talk about affordability is a requirement and will be a requirement, it always has been, quite frankly. Um, do we have the governance model right, the mixture between what the government does and what industry does in the various areas uh, to achieve the kind of affordability improvements that have to occur, not only for new ships, but the existing fleet as well? And any of you that might want to uh, come on, comment on that, thanks. Sure, I'll just uh, say what you taught me, sir. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's always about picking the right tool for the job. Uh, some some jobs the government needs to do the inherently governmental jobs. The the you know the Coast Guard exists to operate. We know that best. We need to put the requirements out there but we don't need to design our own ships and we don't need to build the infrastructure to design our own ships, but we do have to manage that design. And in order to be able to manage the design, you gotta have designers. You gotta be a smart enough buyer. You gotta do enough of your own work. That's why we operate the Coast Guard Yard. You have to do enough of your own work to know what you're buying and to be a smart buyer so you can set up the governance, set up the controls and make sure you're affordable. It also adds to competition. Competition makes everybody better. If government's competing against industry, our, our Coast Guard yard has to compete with commercial availabilities. It keeps them better, it keeps the yards better. And competition just makes everybody better, it keeps everybody sharp. So that's how what we're using right now to make sure we're getting the best bang for the buck and we're making sure our new assets are affordable. I'll, I'll just add to it, not for ships, but um, on our ground-based mid-course, defense system over the last uh, year and a half or so, we have increased our degree of government expertise and relied less on the contractor base to kind of figure out all the things that are needed. We did that by actually leveraging several different FFRDCs and um, got one group that's a lead and leveraging into all of them. We call it a technical design agent. I think the Navy's very familiar with that term. We somewhat copied it from what we were doing in the Aegis BMD system and brought it over to the GMD system. So just, you know, uh, so Bruce said it about, I mean, competition, that, that makes us better, uh, it makes us all better. But in the, in the shipbuilding industry, there's a lot of areas where we just don't have that competition, right? So you're, you're in a model, and I was in that for 20 years. I, I cut my teeth in PO carriers, okay, uh, in competition there at, the, at the, at least the uh, prime level. And, uh, you know, so the, the government, it has to be the competition. You know, we're the thing that 
the, the challenges, the, the hours and the material costs and uh, competition do, is not doing that. So we're having to, uh, having to do that. So the, you talk about governance structure. Well, that, so that becomes a, a real challenging aspect for a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, you know, major parts of the shipbuilding industry to figure out how to best work that and keep those relationships healthy and positive and, and moving forward and, 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 and trying to figure out ways to get, uh, to get costs down in sole source environments. Man, that's, if you got a secret recipe on that, I'd love to hear it. So we're, that's a never ending battle. Admiral Benedict, yes, uh, you mentioned three different uh, areas that uh, your program has used in order to enhance the reliability. Um, but in doing any of those three areas, and you probably do more, it costs more to do that than to not do that. But can you turn around and say, this is the rate of return on those dollars we put in that upfront bucket? Um, I would say explicitly in a dollar per effort type of a metric, no. Um, but I would say that the investments that we made were not to improve reliability, it was to maintain demonstrated reliability. Uh, and in addition to that, I would say we traded off dollars against the number of submarines or the number of tubes per submarine required in order to perform the STRATCOM uh, mission set. So I would say that in the overall trades that we did with Mr. Stackley as part of sizing the Ohio Replacement Program, all those, all those topics were considered in that analysis. And the result was 12 boats, 16 tubes, and the Trident II D5 system maintaining demonstrated performance was sort of the sweet spot in, in where we landed on, uh, on how to size that underwater mission. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, this will wrap it up. I want to thank the, uh, the uh, distinguished members of the panel. And uh, I have something for them. Uh, the highly coveted uh, ASNI uh, Day 2016 coins. So, gentlemen.